Video games will rot your brain. Video games will make you an antisocial outcast. They'll desensitize you to gory, brutal acts of violence. They encourage you to be more aggressive in real life. Does this sound familiar? How many times have you heard news stories or talking points which cast video games in a negative light? It's not uncommon that every so often a tragedy will occur and video games will get the blame for influencing negative behaviour and causing poor mental health. This is RaiderCast, and in this episode I'm going to be speaking with massive Tomb Raider fan and clinical psychologist Dr. Amy Goodrum about the positive effects and benefits of playing games to balance the scales and shine some light against the dark portrayal of video games in the media. So, welcome Amy to RaiderCast. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat today. This is great. I'm very much looking forward to this because it's going to be a very different kind of episode to anything that I've approached before topic wise. So I'm very, very excited to dive into it. But before we do, I would love to hear your Raider journey, how you first encountered Lara Croft and Tomb Raider and what the series means to you and how it's inspired you. So the first time I saw the game, I remember it so well. It was uh, American Thanksgiving, which is always towards the end of November. Uh, 1997. So I remember where I was living and we had my husband's family over for Thanksgiving and his brother, I think, had a bootleg copy of the game of Tomb Raider 1. And he's like, I got to show you this game. And he was not like a person who played video games or I don't even think he had a PC, but we had one. So we booted up my husband's laptop and he had it a save game at Lost Valley. A classic. My very first impression is, of course you're playing this. She has huge boobs. <laughs> <laughs> like she definitely appealed to the male gaze, right? Uh -huh. So my first impression was like, really? Like they had to make a, male, a female character with large breasts. But then, you know, I'm looking at the gameplay and I had played things like Myst and, and Dark Castle on the Mac when I was in grad school. I loved those games, but I'd never seen anything like this. And then that T-Rex like came around the corner and I thought, oh gosh, like I'd like to play something like this. This looks fun. But I was like just starting out in my profession, um, you know, relatively newly. We'd only been married for five years. My husband was starting grad school. So didn't do a lot of gaming until we bought our house in 2000. And we live in a part of um, New York state that gets a lot of snow. Um, and so that winter we had nearly 200 inches of snow, which is, I think, around 490 centimeters. <laughs> it's a lot. That's incredible. Wow. It was the sixth highest snowfall ever in our area. So I had happened to buy <laughs> Tomb Raider 3. And I started playing it that winter because there wasn't a lot of going out. <laughs> 200 <laughs> inches of snow. <laughs> had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to use the controls. I didn't know how to move. Like, I didn't know anything. And this is dial in the age of dial up internet, of course. Mm -hmm. And we had yeah. no cable where we, we live out in the country. So we live in a place where there's more cows than people. So oh, lovely. no, no cable. But I stumbled along uh, Stella's Tomb Raider site. Even back then. It because her started a few years before that downloaded pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of walkthrough just so I could get through the game. And by the end, I and then I made the mistake of um, hmm, I played, I think, South Pacific second. That was not a good oh. idea. And then London, <laughs> and that was not a good idea. And then had Nevada at the end. It was crazy. But I kind of had, I was like, I kind of really like this. So I just kept kept up with the games. And, um, you know, by the time my son was born, which was a couple of years later, I think I'd played through all of the ones that had come out. So I've played all of the games. I'm currently a streamer and I'm really, and I'm a part of Stella, Stella from Stella's Tomb Raider site. She is the captain of a Tomb Raider community team. 
and we raise money for Extra Life, which benefits children's hospitals, and I raise money for our local children's hospital. So that is, that's, and I went to the Derby event where Core Design was this year for the first time, so hopped across the pond and met a lot of people who I knew through online or other streamers, but had never met in person, so that was a real treat, including yourself. Include, yes, yes, it was absolutely lovely to meet you. It was, wow, that's so cool. I loved hearing that. It's fascinating as well how you dived right into Tomb Raider 3. Like, that's not the easiest start, is it? No, that was a mistake. <laughs> um, and it, as you can see behind me, I also collect Tomb Raider memorabilia. So that's something that I've enjoyed doing for about 20 years now. And um, I can see some very rare ones as well. That's amazing. Yeah, I have some really nice stuff. So that'll that'll buy my son a house someday, hopefully. <laughs> oh, wow. That's lovely. <laughs> Oh, goodness, I just saw the wetter one as well behind you. Yep, that's, there, there she is. <laughs> oh, that's the mother load. Wow, incredible. Oh, what a collection. Lots of fun to do over time. And I was fortunate, I started 20 years ago, so things that are very expensive now were not that expensive then. So Perfect. it just built up over time, and, and yeah, that's where I'm at. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing a little bit about your profession and how that ties into gaming and Tomb Raider as well, potentially. We'll see. Um, but before we do, would you like to give us uh, an overview of what it is you do? Sure. So I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and that means that um, I did four years of undergraduate work uh, and then a five-year graduate program got a PhD in clinical psychology. So my specialty is working with children and adolescents. And, you know, um, clinical psychology, I think, has traditionally been thought of people come in with a diagnosis and you, you treat a disorder. But I really take a, a different approach. I take a positive psychology approach, which is we all, regardless of diagnoses or conditions, have certain strengths that we bring to the table and certain weaknesses that we need to improve on. And however that shows up, that's what we work on. Um, and I also supervise the work of graduate students in clinical psychology at a local university. Um, I'm also involved with my undergraduate university on an alumni board. I also am involved with a fitness and technology company where I run a lab class. So I, I have my hands in a lot of different wow. things. Wow, <laughs> super busy. Yeah. Wow, excellent. So on the topic of, um, of gaming when it comes to uh, therapy, I guess before we dive into the benefits of gaming and let's just say the benefits of Tomb Raider for the for the sake of the yeah. episode, um, why do you think that video games are such a target of, of media people saying that they are a bad influence when films and television can include the same kind of, of negative content? It's a really good question and I think part of that is because whenever there is new technology that it comes out and video gaming even though it's been around for a while is still relatively new because it's constantly evolving and changing um, there's sort of a freak out reaction or a moral panic that happens um, you know i was digging into the research and in 1545 so a while ago there was a scientist <laughs> scientist Conrad Gessner who was very distressed with the printing press because he said too many books are both confusing and harmful to the brain so <laughs> so this has been around for a while <laughs> you know and and there's always been a panic and a knee-jerk reaction about entertainment technology right so there is just as much of a panic if not more around television you know televisions became popular in common in households between like 1950 and 1970 and people became very concerned about children's well-being with television and violence to the point where the surgeon general in 1969 said that um, there's a significant concern about this deemed it a public health problem which you know, it may or may not have been, but what that did in the US is it allowed for funding of lots of studies to finally see is this a problem or not? Because mm. one thing we do as psychologists, whether we're clinical psychologists or we study work or we study social problems or social issues, is that we like to do studies. So we collect data, mm -hmm. we do evidence based approach and, and research to the best of our ability, we an analyze it with statistics, and then we try to generate um, solutions, which are quite often much more nuanced than what happens in uh, in in the general media or how it's written about. 
So what happened is they they looked at 23 different studies and the results were, well, it depends. <laughs> you know, there are, it's a multi, you know, children becoming aggressive because of, of television. It's really a multifactorial problem, right? Two children can watch the exact same thing and have very different reactions to it mm. or behave differently, perhaps after. So again, it depends, but nobody likes to hear that. It's very simple to make it dichotomous in black and white. So it's the, it's the same with video games, still a, a knee jerk reaction. Okay. That, yeah. Okay. I can follow that. That's, that does make sense. And, um, I wonder, what do you think to the, the idea that because the medium is very interactive, that that ties into it as well? I think that's part of it. There is an assumption that if you are interacting with a medium, that it may have more impact on you than a passive viewing. And that um, the more it may get close to a real life image, the worry is perhaps that might be disinhibiting or numb somebody to something. Oh, However, yeah. the research is may may be very different than what people might assume <laughs> it could be i suppose as well on that front that only within the last arguably the last 10 years have video game graphics become borderline photorealistic especially within the last five years so maybe studies on the realism aspect of video games versus more cartoony style. So I was going to ask, uh, do you think the games with more realistic graphics are going to be targeted more by people who deem games a bad influence than games with a more stylized cartoonish look? Like, for example, the, the, the old 90s Tomb Raider games. If you compare that to, say, um, Call of Duty today, where... It's huge difference in graphical style and one is obviously much more realistic whether or not the more realistic would be a bigger target but maybe as that's over the last five years or so has only really become a thing we don't have the data to to really dive into that we don't and it's so interesting because you know in 1996 97 you know when the first tomb raiders came out i mean that that looked realistic strangely enough you know what i mean <laughs> Like the idea of the definition of realism is a moving target, I think. Do you know of any sort of specific examples, maybe with Tomb Raider being demonized by the press for excessive violence or things like that? Uh, there was one uh, moral panic around Tomb Raider. Let me find it in my notes so I can share it with you exactly. It was very interesting. So a rumor surfaced when Tomb Raider 1 came out that if you pressed a certain sequence of buttons or actions, uh, Lara would get naked and you could run around with her naked, which is not true. <laughs> Actually, when you press this certain sequence that came out, if you did it, she, she like exploded <laughs> or died oh, or something. Oh, so it's the exploding it's not true. Lara Amazing. Now, programmers, of course, who weren't associated with Eidos or, or Core did create a nude raider mod and people could download it. You know, people could have yeah. it and, run around, and make her run around naked. but. The, the game team had nothing to do with this. <laughs> um, not in terms of violence. I have heard concerns about the, you know, Lara Croft and the depiction of femininity, you know, mm. in terms of the appearance, which is, you know, I, very idealized and, and especially, I think, appealing to the sort of straight male gaze, perhaps. And in most video games, most characters, male or female, are designed to be, I think, what a majority or people would consider physically appealing. So that's not unusual. Nevertheless, important to pay attention to. But that's just the physical appearance that we're not talking about the character and what she accomplishes. <laughs> yeah, 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 that makes sense. Uh, I remember reading a long time ago as well about how... Um... Peter were very angry at Tomb Raider, but that was along the lines of her massacring wildlife or endangered wildlife in in that case. Um, I haven't heard that they've been angry with the series lately, but I would venture a guess as it's because she's mostly killing people nowadays rather than um, endangered species. <laughs> And, you know, um, that PETA concern, does that, you know, it is based on the assumption that 
um, people might not care as much about animals because they're killing them in a video game, right? So that mm. that's a pretty big assumption that would have to be tested. Um, my, my experience of video gamers is that they love their animals and pets and would never go out and shoot an endangered species. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Within your profession, obviously I'm not going to delve into anything that's like confidential with any patients or anything, but have there been any cases uh, that you have uh, had to deal with Tomb Raider as an example of uh, someone someone's mental health? Not Tomb Raider specifically. Um, and my experience of, so, you know, I, again, as a clinical psychologist, I work with a population of children and teenagers who, who come in with certain strengths and weaknesses, but may be predisposed to some problem behaviors in their life, right? Or struggles with how they see themselves, how they view the world, um, and to help mitigate that so that their development gets on track. In general, mo I would say probably the m most, if not 100% of the people that I work with have played video games of one form or another, be it Candy Crush on their mother's phone to, you know, Call of Duty to, I hear a lot about Fortnite. I, I know a lot about <laughs> Fortnite. So um, that really appeals to like eight to like 12 to 18 year olds, really. The vast majority of them have not had major problems with gaming. That's good. That's really good. And during the pandemic, when everybody was online, it was a real lifeline for some kids to their friends and to other experiences and and escape to a, you know, a little bit of escapism is not a bad thing. It's when you use it as your majority coping strategy that it becomes unhealthy, but a little bit of escapism of parents being really stressed out and grandparents being sick with COVID and are they going to live or die? We don't know. Um, is, is okay to use gaming to, to help with that. That's really lovely as a support mechanism. That's that's really nice. That's good. I remember during the first year of the pandemic, I'm, I've always been a, a big gamer with, well, not so much across the board, but I've always sort of fixated on certain series like uh, Tomb Raider, for example. Um, but when the pandemic occurred, and I remember one game that was really big was Among Us. And everyone was playing Among Us and you'd call your friends and you'd get them to come online and everyone would be in these little groups. And I couldn't do it. And I tell you why, it's because it stressed me out so much. If you were picked to be like the imposter, I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit there and like pretend and lie and sneak around. It just, it did something to me inside. I was like, I hate this. I really hate this game. And it's good you realized it because gaming can be problematic when somebody may not realize their emotional state and then use it to escape or use it to mm. try to overcome an emotional state that could be better overcome or managed in other ways. I've done in the past a few shout outs online where I've invited people to send over their own personal stories about uh, what Tomb Raider has meant to them or any way they, they feel particularly drawn to Lara as a character. And a fair few times I've had heartbreaking stories of people who said that they felt low and down or bullied or othered in their own lives and Tomb Raider was the support that basically let them carry on with their life. They would come home from school from a horrible day of being bullied or just a horrible day at work and they would find strength through Lara they would they would see Lara as like the embodiment of themselves whether it be her personality as as like some of the the older games she was a tough no-nonsense type character but they have said like she gave me the support I needed and she gave me the strength to carry on and that's it's an incredible testament, I guess, not only to Tomb Raider, but to the power of gaming as well. It's huge. It's huge. And I think the piece, if we had to pick one of the reasons why gaming can be positive, right? And, and that's not to, that is not to minimize how gaming can be negative, but we're here to talk about the positives and we're not going to talk about moral panics. <laughs> we did that already. <laughs> but one of the positives about Tomb Raider is it, it is pretty immersive. You know, it's not, it may not be as immersive as, as some of the, you know, 
MMOs and stuff, but it's a pretty immersive experience and there's storytelling and there's a narrative and, um, and discovery and role playing are part of it. And I think in a game, you can also um, identify with the character in certain ways that um, maybe how you aspire to be or maybe you want to be, especially for people who um, like find comfort in that if their true identity doesn't match or is contrary to the community that they live in, right? And so if you find things in that character that you can identify with and appreciate, it may help you cope with some very difficult situations. And, and that's a really lovely thing about Tomb Raider. Um, and, you know, we saw it at Darby. I mean, what a lovely, diverse community of people. One of the cosplayers who won is a wheelchair user and Tomb Raider player. Um, and, you know, I don't know her full story, but I'm sure she takes inspiration from Tomb Raider, right? Like we all do who are in that room, not just her. Um, there were people there who self -identify, who identify as being on the autism spectrum. And um, there are people who talk about their mental health concerns who were there. And a lot of people have shared how Tomb Raider has been very impactful for them in getting through really difficult spots. Because first off, you know, at least in the older games, there's not a lot of emotionality. She just perseveres. She yeah. just perseveres. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> That's something that I've always found true about it is that because there's not a lot of uh, emotionality, as you said, she was very much an avatar that you could project yourself into rather than the more heavily narrative driven games these days where you're always you're either hearing her thoughts or she's talking a lot and you're always aware of her mental state or how she feels about certain things, whether they be places and she's like this tomb is beautiful or, or people and the the attitude that she does or doesn't take with a certain person but in the older games she was very largely silent and you could project your own emotions onto this character and so i think that sort of connection to her was in some ways stronger because it was very personal and because it was very custom to each player I think that's really true and you you could and and so I I first off I'm just gonna say I enjoy all of the games the older ones the newer ones I play a lot of level editors so custom games are really that's sort of a niche for me but one thing that is appealing about the older games is that you could just impart your own kind of psychology on the character if you will um, and I also like that so going back to what I first said about her you know physical attributes yeah, I mean, it makes sense from a game and monetary perspective. You have to make the character look unusually attractive to the male gaze, let's say. However, she was doing things, and this was the 90s, and like, I mean, I was, I was, um, I think I was like 27 or 28 when Tomb Raider came out. So I was actually Lara's age, you know, according to the, mm, the booklet. And yeah. Everyone. I mean, women didn't, you know, there, there were still very strong conventional ideas about how women and men behaved and they were very sex stereotyped. Um, that's changed. I mean, it's still that way. It's changing, but it was especially that way in the nineties. Um, I think there was some movement like, you know, in the seventies and then in the eighties that started to clamp down. And then the nineties, it's like, go back to your, you know, traditional behavior in some ways. And, and, and she didn't. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> she's like i mean she had the luxury of being very wealthy so she could go wherever she wanted even though she was rejected by her parents you know supposedly cut off but you know she was intelligent and she was a problem solver and she was gritty yeah. and that was really cool and that that's what appealed to me you know she was gritty she wasn't stupid and sometimes reckless and made mistakes and worked at correcting them and i thought that was cool too that's really way, that's a really cool way of putting it. I like that. It was uh, it was a very. She she hit at the same time as girl power, so you had like all of the Spice Girls things and everything at that time. And it was very. I'm sure there's a better word, but very zeitgeisty, and she sort of just fit right there as this icon of the '90s and and everything that was happening at the time. It's really cool. So true. And I think in the newer games, then um, where there's much more of her own kind of personal psychology coming in and more of a narrative story, that also fits with the times too. 
um, so so it all makes sense in its own way. Yeah, it's so, it's cool that way. And I, you know, an, another thing about Tomb Raider that I think is I, I don't know if it's unique to Tomb Raider, but it's certainly important is that for many people who identify as like non-binary or people who identify as gay or lesbian, it it created an environment that was very open to like acceptance. And I think that's because like, it just wasn't even an issue for her. You know, like it, it never was a thing. She wasn't straight. She wasn't gay. She wasn't sexual. She wasn't asexual. It just wasn't, it wasn't a thing. So you can like be yourself with the character, which is like super, super, super cool. And I think that's a really, really important uh, part of the community too. Yeah, I think so. I think that being important back then, I think that's still important now, even for people who just are starting to come to the series. I'm sure that they will get a sense of that. But I know that there was uh, talk that uh, the the writers would have loved for her to be in a relationship with Sam. I know that was talked about a lot in the the Survivor series, but maybe they left it out because it's still not said people can interpret for themselves. I think that's still true. Yeah, and I think it gave people access to like coming out to themselves and maybe coming out to their community or family that it might not have before. I don't have, there's no data on that. I'm not speaking as a psychologist. I'm just speaking as a fan and somebody who, um, you know, uh, met a lot of great people at Darby. <laughs> <laughs> As a final sort of question to sort of go back to the, the topic at large, there's a lot has been said in the past by the media about how uh, video games are a bad influence and they're demonized by different groups of people. Has there been anything that you've seen in your experience that this narrative can be changed about certain games or certain types of games? Uh, maybe ones that feature violence or do you think that once someone or a group of people demonizes a particular media that that's it it's set in stone well i would encourage um people to keep first of all have a growth mindset not a fixed mindset so a growth mindset means that you're flexible in how you approach things that you're willing to dig in and do the work to really um understand something instead of a fixed mindset where i'm just going to make a decision it's based on how i feel and that's that Right. So have a growth mindset about it, even if you have a strong feeling one way or the other, because the reality is there can be problems with video gaming and there can be wonderful outcomes as well. It's gaming itself is not a problem, um, just like feelings themselves are not a problem. It's what you do with it that matters. Right. And gaming has so many positives that it's important to recognize that as well. It's a wonderful opportunity for people to um, have an experience with their children and teach their children certain values and ways of constructively using media. It um, allows for appropriate expression of emotions. You know, when you come home after a bad day of work, let's not kick the dog. Let's maybe play Tomb Raider or Call of Duty or whatever, right? Like you're appropriately sublimating a negative um, emotion. It can improve positive emotions. It's been shown, that's been shown. Um, moderate gameplay has been shown to increase emotional stability, even decrease depression and loneliness, and moderate being three to nine hours a week. So there are all kinds of positives. I would just encourage people to look at the literature that's out there, and there's a lot of it, and I can even give you links to, um, you know, I can even share references with you, and become good consumers of science. You know, I believe in the scientific method, I believe in rigor, and I think, you know, if um, that is the best way to approach any kind of social concern and any kind of technology. Let's research it. Let's look at what the data says and let's parse it out in a meaningful and nuanced way, not in an all or none way. That was absolutely beautifully said. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Wow. Uh, so if anyone who's listening or watching this episode would like to reach out to you online, where should they look? Where can they find you? Wow. Probably a lot of places. Um, I'm I'm not on much social media. I do have a I have a Discord for my gaming community, um, and uh, gosh, I'm on Twitch every so often. Um. <laughs> 
I will include as many links as you want below the video as well so people can contact you. Well, Dr. Amy Goodrum, this has been a absolutely fascinating chat and I'm so pleased that you came on Raidercast to chat about it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Very welcome. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and thank you very much. You too. Take care.